Now I'd like to introduce Alex Cho. Alex? And Alex, I'm going to introduce you, okay? Oh, then, oh, I'm sorry. Alvaro, that's okay. Um, so thanks, Ron. Um, tonight, uh, lab, uh, lab student birder Alex Cho has the honor of introducing Alvaro Har um, Jaramillo. Alex is from the Bay Area and is an active Lab um, S member. And he's recently been on a pelagic trip, his very first pelagic trip with Alvaro, and he had a great time. So uh, uh, Alex, please introduce Alvaro. Thank you, Susan and Ron. Tonight, Los Angeles Birders is very pleased to have Alvaro Jaramillo with us. Alvaro was born in Chile, raised in Canada, and now resides in Half Moon Bay with his family. Alvaro has been birding since he was 11 years old when he found a pair of binoculars and a field guide left behind in a fishing boat. As a teenager, Alvaro started guiding birding trips in his local patch. Alvaro has a BS in zoology and a master's degree in ecology and evolution from the University of Toronto and is currently an affiliated senior biologist with the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. Alvaro is an expert on the birds of California and North America and has written the American Birding Association Field Guide to Birds of California and New World Blackbirds. In addition, he is an authority on the birds of Chile and has authored the Birds of Chile and is collaborating on Chile's important bird areas program and helping to identify a new bird species there, the Bincoya storm petrel. Alvaro also has his own company, Alvaro's Adventures, where he leads birding trips throughout the world and, lucky for us, many pelagic trips out of Northern California. Alvaro's passion is not only to understand the biology and natural history of birds, but to improve other people's enjoyment of birds and further avian conservation. As such, Alvaro is a recipient of the Eisenman Medal of the Linnaean Society of New York, which honors people who excel in ornithology and encourage amateurs. Tonight, Alvaro will be introducing us to the large gulls. The adults are strikingly beautiful, yet gull identification can be very complex. The large gulls are a group that is recent, where speciation is happening as we speak, where things are still messy and unclear. Rather than solve all problems in gull identification, Avaro will tackle tidbits, desperate parts of the puzzle. He will tell us about the evolutionary history of northern large gulls and simplify how gulls are aged. It's not that hard. And Avaro will give us some pointers on how to look at gulls and make sense of them. He will also throw in some observations on some of the Asian rarities that tantalize us in California and introduce those species and what to look for. So we are in for a night, or maybe a nightmare, of big call challenges. And with Alvaro leading us, we are in good hands. So without further ado, please welcome Alvaro Jaramillo. Hey, thank you, Alex. That was, wow. That's, uh, thanks so much. <laughs> you guys are making me feel real welcome here. Um, and uh, really, thank you for inviting me to talk to you about goals. And let me just share the screen here and, um, and start going. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that see me as um, kind of insanely interested in goals and they don't understand why. And I think I'm gonna try to give you some ideas of why this might be, why I find them interesting, but also give you tips on how to identify them. And, you know, not every one of the species, but we're gonna kind of tackle, like Alex said, little bits here and there. Um, and uh, let's see, I guess we can move. See, one of the things is you have this huge diversity, especially if you go around the world looking at, at gulls and they really are fine looking uh, birds. Now, uh, in particular, the adults, you know, with these the white bodies, the white tails, the gray backs or black backs, black wings, white wings, whatever they might be, they have a really classic look to them, really just to me, clean looking patterns and to me, really pretty. And so I like that, you know, and um, obviously there's the brown ones, which can be, you know, the immatures, which can be a kind of a nightmare. But I always tell people start looking if you're thinking about tackling the goals, the adults. They divide up into multiple different groups, especially worldwide. But here in California, we can sort of think about, about them as the smaller ones and the bigger ones. And I'm gonna talk more really about the big ones uh, rather than the small ones, just, just to get a few, fewer number of species and a more cohesive set of, of gulls. The smaller gulls 
in fact, were originally identified way back as terms because they're so small and different looking. Um, there's this uh, whole thought of like, you could be looking at, you know, beautiful tanagers and hummingbirds and all of these wonderful birds we have. Why do people, birders, often birders with a lot of experience wanna watch ugly brown birds like gulls, immature gulls or flycatchers or sparrows. And it's got to do, I think, with the fact that your brain as a birder functions differently when it's tackling these more complicated problems rather than the situations where it can immediately recognize what it's looking at. The moment that you know I have to really think about an identification, I feel like I'm 11 years old again, learning how to bird. And it's a lot of fun to go through that puzzle. So I think this is one of the reasons that recognition versus identification that allows some people to gravitate or makes people gravitate to these kinds of birds. So yeah, you know, one person's nightmare is another person's heaven. And I, I, I think that way about crossword puzzles. I cannot do crossword puzzles. If you, if you put me in a place and I had to do a crossword puzzle and, you know, otherwise I would never go birding again. Gosh, you know, I might never go birding again because I wouldn't be able to finish it. This is a nightmare for me. My brain does not work that way. But I look at a goal and I see a different kind of puzzle. I see other things that, you know, they, they sort of teach me over time that I felt like they really have been my teachers in terms of how to observe nature and how to observe detail and also observe a whole, whole bird, the kind of holistic sense of, of bird. So goals really are my sensei, my teachers. Um, they really are. And uh, I wanted to put this uh, image from Kill Bill because just as an aside, do you know that this bird that was just identified brand new to science, Heliothropus, the Inti tanager, for a while was going to be called, or people called it the, the Kill Bill tanager because of the yellow and black. So if, uh, if you haven't heard about this crazy new bird, it was uh, just described from, it's in Bolivia and Peru. Um, and not only is it a brand new species of bird, it is one of the most unique looking new species of birds in the last 20, 30 years and a brand new genus, Heliothropis, which means tanager of the sun. Inti tanager is the official name, which means sun tanager in Aymara Quechua language. But anyways, a little aside there on, on Kill Bill. <laughs> Back to gulls. Um, by the way, this is a ring bill gull. And if you ever see a gull with a band, especially one that's uh, colored, full you know plastic with a number take that info down or take the uh, photograph and send it in there are more and more color banded gulls in north america with numbers where we be able to track where they're from what they look like and actually start sorting out how they age because once we have banded birds that are known identity we can we can understand how they change over time but yeah so these lyrophiles, these people that love gulls do exist. And this is sort of the time, you know, when you're, when you drive by a place um, like this and you, you wanna get in there and hang out for a day or two, you know, you've got a problem. You've got a gull watching problem, but you know, you could watch warblers and all these, you know, other birds, but they're not always around, you know, sort of eventually winter hits. Well, hold on a second. Yeah, we're in California, winter hits. And, um, and then we have to look at other things that come down from, from, the, uh, from the north. And you know, really we have this real huge diversity of ducks and a huge diversity of gulls, particularly the gulls farther north in California, Southern California doesn't get as many of them, um, but it gives us this whole brand new um, group of birds to be thinking about that replace many of the, the um, you know, migratory species that go down to the neotropics that leave, leave us at that time. They, you know, this photograph here, this is a, a good flock in Half Boom Bay, one of the good days when there's tons to look at. It can be really a nightmare scenario or you could look at it a different way. There are very few instances in birding where you can really see lots of individuals all out in the open that sit there and will sit there for lots of time you can put you know, your, your scope on them and go bird by bird by bird. Try to do that with sparrows. You, you know, you'll never be able to do that with a lot of groups of birds to see this many all out in the open and where you can study them. 
you can then start comparing adult birds, you know, this nice adult western gull here, the back color, and you see if there's other birds that have paler backs that are adults, and you say, well, those can't be western gull, and you start putting the puzzle together using the, the flock as your tool, essentially, to understand what the other birds are. So people say gulls are really variable, and maybe they are, but maybe we just don't know how variable other birds are because we never get to see them like this, right? Um, so yeah, the flock comparison is really the useful way to, to, uh, to look at some of these goals and have standards that you know, like these California goals, right? You might say, okay, well, how do I know they're California goals? They have a dark kind of a, a medium gray uh, back, not the real pale gray. So the pale, pale gray is the ringbill goal, the herring goal, you know, the uh, Bonaparte's goals. Um, terns have this pale gray like this bird here. The Californians are a little darker gray. They also have always have dark eyes. So they sort of look a little bit serene in their facial profile. And I always tell people that to me, the streaking pattern on a California gull is all sort of in the back of the head. It's not in the front, often the, the front of the neck and throat is all white and all the stuff is back here. So they really have that mullet haircut. So once you know that look for the mullet and the darker gray back, and I haven't even looked at legs yet, but greenish legs are special, greenish or yellow legs are special. But so you have this standard and then you go, okay, I know these are all California goals. They all look about the same. And then you see something else in there and what, how does it differ? It's bigger, it's paler backed, streaking all over the place. You know, and if, I, if it was in focus, you might see it has a yellow eye, um, pinker legs. So then you start putting together the, the idea that that's a herring goal. That's how I try to identify goals, using the flock as, as the tool. And whenever you get frustrated and you really are sort of having trouble, look at a Hearman's goal and go, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. And reset yourself and say to yourself, yeah, I can identify goals. But here's a set of California goals that are different ages. And um, what I would say to people is that is the adult with the white body, white tail, um, the solid grays on the upper parts and wings, you know, black on the wings, or they could be gray or white, depending on the species. Those are what you wanna begin looking at. And you not only look at the features, the colors, the patterns on the wings, you look at their shape. If the bill blob ended, is it, a really sort of parallel shape bill. Do the foreheads come up really steep? Do the, does the bird look mean? Does it look calm? Does it look cute, right? All of those things are what you look at on the adult goals. And eventually, once you really get the shapes down, these other ages become easier because they just actually look like California goals in shape, right? So this is the adult, this is a three, third cycle, this is the second cycle. So we're going back in time, this is the first cycle. Youngster, big gulls tend to be real brown. They get a gray back and blacker wings and tail in the second year. And then third year, they basically look the, like the adult, but they have something off, like there's brown on the wings or black on the tail, something off or their, their bill colors aren't quite right. And that's how you really simplify the aging process here. There's a lot of um, confusion about leg colors, what to look for, and so forth. And I tell people pink legs are kind of, so what? That doesn't tell me that much. Pink legs are the standard, the baseline, the default leg color of a big gull. There are some gulls that sometimes don't have pink legs, and that would be Hearman's with black legs, or then there's the yellow or greenish type leg colors. Mew, short bill gull, ring bill, California, lesser blackback, yellow footed. So those are the only ones that get um, yellowish or greenish legs. So there's a, that's actually helpful. Those are, it's a fewer number of species that have that yellowish or green legs. The issue is that like, this is a ring build gull, a young one, it has pink legs. So that ring build, that is a gull without pink legs, they can have them when they're young. So this is what I'm saying. Pink legs don't tell you that much. They're default. They can start out pink leg, they go to green or yellow later. So really the important thing to look for is when they have yellow or green legs. That tells you something more special um, than specific. And um, that's, I think, a real valid thing to be looking for. And then if you see a real you know, yellow-footed gull, they're super amazing species of, you know, they have, they've got almost a, like a 
fake color of yellow and orange on the bill and legs. Um, I tell people, depending on where you live, to find one or two reference species of gulls that are common and look at the adults and learn them really well, you know, sort of like a California gull, or maybe it's the Western gull down here, which is real bulky, thick bodied, has a really small eye up on top of the head and always a banana yellow bill, really bright banana yellow bill as, a, as an adult. Or it could be the ring bill gull here with, you know, it's ring bill. This is one of the ones with greenish or yellow legs, slim, um, the pale gray back, just like herring gulls have pale gray backs. So those are real pale gray ones. Western's a dark, almost blackish backed. And then California is a dark gray back. So there's sort of three tones in here. And learn those reference species, what they tell you, what they look like, the size, how they relate to others. And then you can see how they will help you as sort of the, uh, they're almost like the rulers. <laughs> I mean, in terms of like a, a you know, a, a, a you know, 30 centimeter, 12 inch ruler that allows you to measure the other gulls as if you know one species or two really well in the flock. And again, the adults are key. Um, herring gull, by the way, looks really mean. They have yellow eyes and have dark around the eyes in winter that accentuates that, that yellow, yellow eyed look. When you know you we treat these big gulls as as sort of a group, you start wondering, well, are they really cl closely related to each other? In fact, you know the multiple different genetic trees that have been, you know, phylogenies have been made on them are clarify that in fact they're very closely related. This whole group here that branches out from this this one branch here, all of these guys, they're all the big white-headed gulls the real big ones, the classics. And they're quite closely related and sometimes so closely related that it's, you know, they're very new branches, very new species, and they hybridize and there's all sorts of funky things going on here. So sometimes it's difficult to know how many species are actually involved. And we'll talk about that in a sec. But um, the real base ones in the group are the Hermans, mu ring build, New common gull, ring build, and then actually Western yellow footed gulls are sort of the, the granddaddies of the entire white, you know, larger white headed group. Um, once there were white headed gulls after the Western yellow footed gull had arrived in, in Asia and um, Europe, we had this division into two clumps the green birds here in this map and the or orangey yellow birds. There were two refugia, let's put it that way, where, where gulls sort of spread from these two, two areas and speciated. And what's interesting to me is that this, these green ones over here include the um, European herring gull. Um, they include the yellow uh, leg gull as well as um, great blackback gull. All of the other ones, you know, Caspian gulls and lesser blackbacks, Vega gulls, our own herring gulls, California gulls, glaucous wing gulls, you know, all of these other birds actually came from this other group. What is kind of interesting, if you think about it here, is that in this green group, on this brown group, we have one kind of herring gull, the North American, Smithsonianus up here is in the brown, Argentatus, the, um, the European gull, uh, herring gull is in the green. So we had two different groups of gulls that went out and kind of conquered the northern hemisphere. And within those two, we might have two birds that actually look so alike that we have, you know, in our heads, there's no way these two things are different, but the genetics are telling us they're in two clumps, two different parts of the gull world. So this is the complexity that we're looking at. This one here is an East Coast herring gull from North America, and this one is a uh, European herring gull. They differ in wing patterns, they differ in the immature plumages, they differ in their calls, they differ in their migration um, you know, distances, a lot of other things. But in fact, we might uh, have been so drawn to the fact that they have the same pale eyes, pinkish legs and pale backs that you know, we didn't see the fact that there's a lot of stuff that's different about them in their biology. But um, you know, just, um, I'll go through a few species just to give you an idea of what they look like or how I think about them. Then I'll tell you a little bit more about aging gulls and then we'll end with the uh, Asian species and some of the rare ones that sort of can show up here. So California gull, California gull sometimes, you know, they have the greenish or 
uh, yellowish legs. In some cases, especially younger birds, they have this real sickly blue-green leg color. That's kind of real distinctive. It happens sometimes in mews, but it's an interesting color to look at um, that is really, to me, you know, younger or some of the duller California gulls. The, that mullet haircut out the back here, white actually on the front, on the chin and, and throat, slim, relatively long wing, darker gray than the standard herring gull, ring bill gull gray. And then the red spot on the bill, which is present on all of these big ones, except for ring billed, mew, short billed, and um, here mints that has an entirely red bill. That red spot is where the chicks peck on to get the gulls to regurgitate food in, in the uh, nesting areas. But in California, the red spot gets hidden by a black um, bit that sometimes is almost like a ring. So that's actually really classic looking uh, California gull and very, very kind of tube-like bill. It doesn't blob out on the end. So then compare that to this thing. This is a mew or short bill gull. I don't like the name short bill gull. I'm, and I'm actually gonna write a, a note why we should continue with mew gull, but uh, that's, that's just, you know, old man yelling at clouds maybe. Um, mew gull is a cute little gull. It just is so different looking than this thing, uh, which in itself is not one of the largest of the gulls. It's already sort of a moderate size. But Mugo has these big eyes and tiny bill and super long wings, like super long. And they just, once you get into the, the idea that this is this kind of adorable, cute little gull, it, you can see that in every plumage type, you know, once you, you know what a Mugol sort of, its expression is like. The dark eyes also give you a sort of more serene look than in ring bill gulls that are a little larger. And, um, when these gulls fly, you know, they have the black wingtips and so forth. There are details you can see in these black wingtips that are important. California gull, for example, has a lot of black, a ton of black, and it's almost cut straight across, almost straight across. With these white bits that at the end here are called mirrors, actually pretty big mirrors. Big mirrors, lots of black. So lots of black, lots of white California gull. Now look at the difference of a mew gull. Mew gull has all of this complex stuff going on. The mirrors are big, there's not as much black. And it almost looks like the trailing edge cuts right in here into the, into the mirrors. In more detail, you start seeing all of this other stuff that's going on in, in these birds. Um, the um, Western gull, we know as sort of the big bulky short winged um, bird with the darker back. They also look at their face. They have, instead of a cute look, they have a almost gargantuan bill that blobs out and their eyes are tiny and kind of right up on top. They, I always think that they, they remind me of a gopher, how their eyes are kind of right up on top and they're very small. Um, so they've got the gopher eyed look and um, that, appears in all the other ages too. It's easier to see on the adults, but um, these, are, these are birds that, you know, if you start making these silly descriptions of them, you will learn what they look like much more readily than if you're trying to be too scientific about them. Big, bulky, kind of fat guy, stumpy in that the wings aren't that long. Look at how different this shape is from that, right? or even that. And once you start noticing these shape differences, they, um, they really, really sort of come out at you. You know, here's a California in the front and a um, Western in the back. Western's darker, bigger. In this case, you see the sort of bulkier head, the different eye placement. Westerns are in, unusual in that they don't get in the winter all of this streaking like most of the other gulls do. They tend to stay white-headed and they tend to stay with the this beautiful banana yellow bill. It's as if they never get into a non-breeding plumage. It's as if they always are kind of ready to go back to the colony. And in fact, they do visit the colonies in winter, unlike the California gulls or ring bills or other, other species we have here. So they are truly much more resident and you know, um, their, their biology is different enough that it shows up in that plumage. So keep that in mind. Um, 
Here's Western gulls as they fly. They, because they're so dark, you can't see their wingtips as readily, like they don't stand out. And they're the only one of our gulls that has on the underwing, the entire black wingtip kind of gets a little paler and it melds right in and goes into the body. So it's as if their, their underwing is actually, you know, real dark, dark blackish gray and almost the black wingtip isn't visible. It varies lighting to lighting, you know, situations, but once you get this, you see that there's no other gull Um, Completely the opposite, but very similar in shape and opposite in the fact that it doesn't, this one has no black on the wingtip, it's just gray on the wingtips and really uniform is the blockus wing gull. But look at how they are similar in shape, bulky kind of short winged, their little eyes compared to the Western gull. They're not that closely related to Western gulls, but they hybridize with them all over the place. And um, they do have similar shapes. And their their um, legs can have a purplish color at times that can be quite distinctive. Um, and um, <clears throat> then, you know, our herring gulls, which look mean and yellow eyed and uh, they, they're, um, that standard, what I call gold gray, like a Bonaparte's ring build, sort of the palest kind of gray is found on the herring gulls. And they variable in their, their streaking pattern and so forth. Then you um, often will confuse them with the Thayer's gull, which is a type of Iceland gull right now in the taxonomy. But, but think about that mew gull again, that cute look, there is an element of that in this Thayer's gull compared to that herring gull. And you look at the eyes and you look at the head shape. One thing is the Thayer's tend to have dark eyes. It gives them a more serene look, shorter bills and steeper foreheads, longer wings, slimmer sometimes. And then there's other aspects that are also useful. Like some, many of the Thayer's gulls have a green tone bill base and actually real bright, bright, like bubblegum pink legs. So that's all without looking at the wings at all. And if you did see the wings, you'll see, oh, there's bigger white um, terminal spots here and it looks like a pale uh, underside of the other primary. And that gives you this idea that something groovy is going on in the wing on a Thayer's gull when it flies. And it's kind of like that mew gull with all of this complexity and the trailing edge kind of cutting in through the, um, the dark of the uh, primaries. And so it's, it's looking at those details. And sometimes photographs are great, um, but you can see a lot of this stuff in the field as well. Um, and, you know, currently we have this situation where the Iceland Kumlin stairs have been, does one, I bet, I bet as we learn more about this, we'll find it's more complicated than that. But what it has created is in fact one species that has every single look of a large white headed gull in one species. And that troubles me <laughs> quite a bit because the Iceland types, Glaucoides, have these white wing tips and we have this intermediate grayish or speckly looking wing tips of Kumlins and then the black of Thayer's and uh, this one smaller, medium, larger. You have a lot of, um, a lot of things going on here, but every kind of um, wing tip pattern the basic sense is found now in one species. So um, that's complicated. Fortunately, we tend to just have mostly Thayer's gulls here in the West, you know, a few things that are a little paler, so we don't have to deal with all of that rainbow of, of gull colors. So one thing is, that why do gulls have so many immature plumages? And um, part of this is because they, um, it varies depending on size and how old they live. The smaller gulls live shorter lifespans. Bigger gulls live larger lifespans, and that applies in general, in general within groups of related birds. That tends to be the case. Bigger ones live longer. So smaller gulls being selected to get, really get on with business of nesting, you know, as soon as, as they can, and they have this sort of one year of immaturity, and by the time that they're, you know, going up to the next next season, they're they're already, you know, breeding. A larger gull at the colony, there's a lot of information exchange that happens in the colony and the larger gull um, is not really, the selection pressures there are for, for a gull not to mate with one that is inexperienced. 
And so there's a lot of information being passed on about your experience based on how old you look. And it's only after you have three years of immaturity, so your fourth year, that you are kind of ready to get to the colony and be accepted as an adult. So, you know, these bigger goals are living 20 plus years and they're spending several years as immatures. Um, so it's related to size and the ones that are the biggest are what we call the four year goals. And one thing that you really sort of want to understand is how they start and how they end. The start and end points, the anchors, juvenile is the first plumage, adult is the last. So you're gonna have this brown thing in this California gold go into this gray and white thing. And um, again, the shapes are gonna be similar, you know, as they, as they age, there's still California golds, but all of these feathers will be changing, you know, and all of this will eventually become gray and all of this will become white. And how does that happen over time? But once you know the start and end points, that is really useful. So here's the Western goal. Let's go and look at the youngsters. So the first cycle, the first year birds, and these big gulls are just brown, big brown things with brown wings and some patterns on the wings and dark tails overall. You know, sometimes there's some paler at the base of the tail, but they're just sort of these big brown things. Next year, they kind of keep that generally brown wing. It's a little bit more pattern, but generally brown. And some of the browns go to black. So the tail becomes blacker. In fact, the secondaries become blacker. Even the, the primaries go blacker. So they go from brown to black, yet the general pattern still dull on the wing. And then they start getting grayer backs, whiter, you know, around the rump and so forth. So you suddenly have a more contrasting burn. You're starting to see the inkling of adult plumage coming in on the back. That's the second year. Then from the second year, you go to the third, the thirds are basically adult-like. They're a lot of gray and sort of the, the inner wing is already sort of adult-like, yet there's something off. There's brown washes somewhere, there's black on the tail, there's a lot of black on the bill. Something is off for a pure adult. So you think, okay, that's the third year, that's the third cycle. So one, two, three cycles of immaturity, then the adult, that's your four year goal. So three and one. And that's really roughly how I do it. it. It varies a little bit species to species, but on the whole, um, you know, this works 90 plus percent of the time. And you can focus on some of the times it doesn't work, but uh, that's when you get into the more, you know, a little bit more of that caveats. And some people say, oh, this one's an advanced first year or, you know, or, you know sometimes delayed second cycle. And those in the end, you know, are just sort of uh, rounding errors in, in most cases, most birds you can identify to age. So this is a Western gold, big blobby ended bill, little small eye. They tend to have a mask look like a dark mask is one thing. And two, and this one is a banded bird. So I know exactly how old it is banded on the Fairlands. Um, by the time that winter rolls around, you'll see that they have like a brown wing and then grayer look, the wash of gray on the body and back and head, it just looks different than the wing. What's happening is that this wing and the tail are the retained um, juvie, so the original juvenile plumage wings, and then everything else has molted during the first fall and winter and it's replaced it with all this gray. So you can see the tonal differences in there. And that's actually really classically Western gull. That's one thing. Then you look at this, this is a Thayer's Iceland gull in the winter, it might be also in February. And so, you know, not that far off from, could be in the same month as this bird, but look at this thing, it looks all even. It's all even, there is no real difference in some of the back and sort of these feathers in tone or freshness or anything. And uh, just to uh, give you an idea, this, look how cute that face is, short bill. And you know, it's, a, it's a, just from this head, you could probably identify it's a Thayer's type um, or Iceland type gull. But um, that's interesting to me. So in the middle of winter, one species can have molted everything and retain the wings. And another species has molted almost nothing. This is fully a juve. Uh, juvenile bird. 
And then you think, gosh, you know, if you start looking in other species, um, it shows up again. But you know what's happening here is that Thayer's is from the Arctic and Western is local. Western hatched and it didn't migrate that far. It was already sort of in the area that hangs out and it started molting almost immediately after it, it, it fledges. While the Thayer's gull, you know, took a longer time to mature in the Arctic there then it finally gets to the point where it can fly south. It has to really fly south right away because winter's coming. And, um, and they delay their entire molt until late winter into spring. So this is really typical of Arctic gulls. And then you look at these two, these two are herring gulls. Sometimes you say, well, herring gulls are so variable, but what is in that variation? What you're seeing here is one bird, and this is from the Great Lakes, it's molted all of this gray stuff and it's retained the wings, even actually molted some of the cupboards in here. This other one, middle of winter, has not molted anything. It's a juvenile. I bet, just like a Thayer's gull, this is a northern or Arctic breeding herring gull. And this is a Great Lakes bird. And I know that because it's banded actually, this one. And um, so there's a lot of biology going on in some of the var variation you see. Um, even in California gulls, some of them will molt some, you know, bits and pieces here and there. But one of the things about California gulls as youngsters is that I always say it looks like the backs are like a salad of different kinds of feathers, like just all sorts of different patterns are all mixed up in one bird. That is really classic California, dark bits and real pale areas and browner ones and grayer ones. But you see these two birds up here, one's got a real pale shoulder, this other one's got a real pale shoulder. Um, I have a theory about those too. I think those are the birds that are early on in the season. There's some that arrive as these cinnamon morph birds. They look cinnamony. I don't know where they're from or what they, but they're cinnamon and they start like fading really quickly. And I think these are cinnamon morph birds that have molted most of their feathers and still retain this really worn cinnamony type thing here. So there's a lot to see when you look at, at, at these gulls in more detail. Here's a, here's a Western gull. And I just want you to squint a little bit on this one individual. Western gulls will often show you this real kind of white stripe here on these covers. And there's also this white right at the edge of the secondaries that sometimes shows through. Real white thing going on here, very dark face, almost nothing going on in there. Um, look at a, a dark herring gull. People have trouble with herring gulls and western gulls. Herring gull often has a pale area at base of the bill and all this speckling going on in here, kind of speckly and there's striping in here but it's not this one big white stripe. It's almost like checkerboard. So you see that checkerboard, you see that pale stripe along the sort of skirt of the those cupboards. Um, Californias have a, a stripe-like situation as well, like a Western, but it's more complicated because they have all of this other stuff going on in the back. But again, look at those, that pale stripe there. Look at that pale stripe. Look at the checkerboardy look to that. And that's a herring gull. So sometimes if you simplify these patterns, you can really get at the, de uh, not get at the detail, but you sort of, the detail's gone and you just look at the pattern, you can have a high, easier time identifying some of these birds. Um, so we went through a few species, we went through some of the ages, we went through some tips and tricks or what you sort of, how you look at gulls. And, and uh, I think one of the things that um, can trouble people up at our latitude here in Half Moon Bay in Northern California is that we do have all of these hybrids. But the moment that you sort of give them a name, you sort of say, okay, the hybrid that we're gonna call Olympic gull is the glaucous wing Western hybrid, and you have a slot for it, it facilitates your life in a way because you can suddenly go, gosh, this one looks really weird or whatever doesn't quite fit. Oh, it doesn't fit because it looks intermediate between these two. So I'm gonna put it into this slot, the Olympic gull hybrid. And, you know, here's a, uh, Western banana yellow bills and so forth. There is a glaucous wing type. Here's a real good glaucous wing over here. You can see that gray 
Um, this one's a little darker, that's darker, that's even darker. It's possible that all three of these are actually hybrids of different levels between glaucous wing and Western, so Olympic gulls. While that one looks like classic, that wing tip there looking not that different in tone from the back, that looks a little too dark, that looks too dark, that looks like a Western, except you know, there's too much uh, markings on the head and the back's not dark enough. So you can sort of see how you, you, you go through this logic, but you never know what they are, you're guessing. And here are different versions of what I think Olympic goals can look like, that hybrid, and they could be, they might not be. Remember, we're just, it's guess, but these are birds that for one reason or the other, um, could it be that, you know, this one looks kind of like herring gull in a sense, but it's got dark eyes, it's got a real bright bill like a Western gull. And then there are other elements of the wing that you can look at when they open up the wing. So some are, you know, you really have to go through more gymnastics, mental gymnastics than, than others. Like this one here looks like a glaucous wing, except a little too dark on the wingtip, a little too dark on the back. So that's like, well, those two features look like a glaucous wing with a bit of Western, or this one's really in between the two. Uh, and that's how I deal with hybrids. And then the other one is we have this other hybrid up here that's pretty common, Cook Inlet Gold, which is herring with glaucous wing. And a lot of these birds look very herring-like, but they'll have pale underwings or they'll have a Thayer's like weird pattern, except they're bigger than Thayer's. And um, they can be glaucous wing type birds with pale eyes. They can be pairing type birds with really glaucous wingish looking um, streaking patterns where it goes sort of side to side rather than up and down. So again, we never know what these are. We make assumptions, but often just having the slot where you can put these hybrids really, really helps out. Um, and finally, let's deal with these cool, well, exciting for the rare bird fanatic um, Asian type gulls and, or uh, gulls from Asia. Um, and one of the things that I think is interesting is that, you know, if for your, um, amount of time spent looking at any group of birds, if you're interested in finding rarities, gulls and shorebirds are probably your best bang for the buck in terms of like the more you sort of go and look at the shorebird flock or the gull flock and you get to know them and you study, you know, what's normal and what isn't, you will eventually find something unusual that is, is a rare bird. This is one that I've, is sort of my quest to eventually find a a black-tailed gull, which is what this is up here. This was taken by Chris Gibbons, a Scottish gull watcher who happened to see it and he didn't know who to phone. So nobody, ever, no local ever saw it. This was some years ago now, but uh, others have shown up. So I just know eventually one will cross my path here. But um, just a little background. There are all of these different um, herring gull, you know, European herring gull, lesser black backish things in Asia and Europe. They kind of divide up into kind of a, a more Southern group and more Northern group. It's sort of ecologically. So you, you have these real Arctic things up here with this orange, this sort of mustard is Vega gull and if you've ever heard of tamarensis, it's this green thing. Huglin's gull is this gray thing. And then that becomes um, this red here is lesser blackback. So lesser blackback, Huglin's, tamarensis are often lumped as one species. And then vega is separated out, is a kind of herring gull related to, well, it depends on who you ask, but it's a kind of herring gull. Then the European herring gulls is green thing. And we have yellow leg gull over here, Armenian gull. There's other things that we don't really sort of have to deal with in California. This, this thing here called Mongolian gull does actually go out to the coast and who knows, it's that shorter distance migrant. But there's evidence that Vega actually reaches California and probably Tamarensis reaches California. And then from the other side, lesser blackback gulls reach California. So that's a little bit of a, the background, and then there's also slatyback, which is not in here because it's it, it sort of breeds in this whole area. 
this was simplifying more of the group that um, that includes the more lesser blackback herring types. But in any case, um, we have in North America variation within herring gulls and some interesting variation that needs to be deciphered to some extent. Um, for example, if you look at a flyby California herring gull, sort of from Alaska, this bird over here on the left, the most common patterns, they have just one little um, mirror on the, on the black wingtip, which is quite scooped out. Do you remember the, remember the California gull that had the straight across almost look to the black wingtip? It's way more scooped out in gray on a herring gull. And then just one mirror. Right then, on the Atlantic coast of of North America, they tend to have two mirrors and slightly different look to them. Sometimes there's two here too, but most of the time it's one. So that's kind of interesting. And then you ponder this thing, and um, this thing is really has a lot of you know white mirror situation going on here. And on the underwing, it actually has almost like an L-shaped pattern of black. Dark eyes, hmm, so this is starting to get interesting. This is the Vega gull. So we go back up, it's the mustard thing up here that winters mostly in Japan, Korea, so forth. And um, it's a Vega gull. So it's like a herring gull with a dark, darker eye, usually red orbital ring when you see them well, and a slightly different pattern of black and white on the wings. And often actually a lot of black kind of little spots that go back in into deeper into the middle of the wing on, on, on Vega. And then in that panel on the north sort of uh, part of uh, Asia that I showed you, there was the um, lesser black back from Europe with its sort of, you know, dark back, yellow legs, yellow eyes. And then this thing here is Tamarensis. This is a a bird that is kind of like a lesser black back, but often paler on the back and the leg colors are variable. They can have a lot of red on the bill. So it starts getting a little interesting and still there's a lot to decipher in these gulls. And then this is Vega gull, like a herring gull, dark eyes and um, darker backed than our, our herring gulls are here in North America. So that's what these Asian birds are. Not, you know, I'm not talking yet about Sladyback because I wanted to show you this other stuff that could be happening, be, you know, sort of below the radar in California. But here's what I think is going on. I think there are a few Vega gulls that make it to California. Th this bird here and this bird here are the same one. This is another one over here and they have a, slaty back look to them, but not quite. They're not as dark. They have a lot of black on the underwings and the pattern on the wing is not with not as strong as on a slaty back gull, red orbital rings. And they can actually stand out in the crowd to a point where you're like, whoa, you know, that is something different. And um, I think Vega gulls are, are vagrant that's showing up in annually in California that a lot of people aren't seeing because it's not a species. If it was a species, we'd all be going goo goo gaga over this thing trying to find it, right? And then the young birds have this these real dark tail bands, white on the base of the, the tail and, you know, rump and so forth, really speckled look to them. So these are also multiple times birds like this have been in Half Moon Bay over the years. So I do think that Vega gull does show up in California. Now, how about Tamir Tamarensis? You know, these are very, these are multiple individuals from Japan. Some of them have yellowish legs. Some of them have pinker legs. They're really kind of variable. They molt very late. They can have a lots of red on the bill, like, like uh, some lesser blackbacks do. And in fact, they are considered part of the lesser blackback group. Lots of black on the wing, right? It goes right in into the inside of the wing when you see them well. And um, they, some of the birds that we think are Lester Blackbacks in North America may be Tamarensis type gulls because they would just pass many of them for a Lester Blackback. As youngsters, as first year birds, they're a little different. They tend to have a little bit more often gray on the back early in the season and the way that they're 
uh, patterns of the cupboards are, are relatively straightforward. Then they have some barring on the greater cupboards. There's a lot of other things you can look for. Tail bases are white like a, like a, like a lesser blackback, but they tend to be paler and a lot of more gray on the back than lesser blackbacks, just to give you an idea. And well, does Tamarensis, you know, Tamirgol exist in California? I think I think they have, but this is probably the best example, or one of the best examples. There's a, another bird that Noah Arthur's been looking up uh, at over the years up farther north that may be an adult um, tamarensis. But this one in, um, in Monterey, the Brian Sullivan photograph, people saw it for multiple weeks and actually changed in, in look, seems to be this species, subspecies, whatever you want to call it, or hybrid. <laughs> That's another option that it could be. But it, it breeds up in this part of Siberia and it migrates across with a lot of east component in its migration to uh, parts of Japan and so forth. So these birds might be going and sometimes just shooting across to the other side of the pond. And finally, we have Sladyback gull, right? Sladyback is darker western-like, but with the mean looking eye, a lot of speckling on the head that often has a creamy co uh, chocolate color. The, the uh, string of pearls, which is this white that comes through kind of like a mugle, kind of like a, a Thayer's gull, big broad white trailing edges. And uh, over the years, this species has been found kind of all over North America. And this is, this is uh, from maybe two years ago on, on eBird. There's been more since then. Interesting how they clump in this latitudinal range and it doesn't matter if you're east or west coast, it seems they just, uh, they're finding their way out to almost anywhere. Um, this is what slaty blacks look like in Japan. Um, there's that classic pattern with the string of pearls. They can look really dirty on the head with um, almost like a dull bills often. Sometimes they're bright like a Western, they vary. And um, I looked for these forever. When I moved to Half Moon Bay, I just thought they have to be here. They have to, they're in Alaska, you know, they're, they're showing up. They have to be showing up in California. And it, I would go to the flock all the time looking for all sorts of birds, of course, just birding. And eventually there it was. This was the first one I, I located in 2005, this second year bird that looked not too, <laughs> I mean, it's not the prettiest thing in the world. It looked a little prettier uh, in February by the time that Dan Singer relocated this bird. But once this individual showed up, it was like the, the floodgates opened up. The next week I found a uh, third cycle slady back gull. And then over the years, I think we've had 32 records in our county, in San Mateo County, most of them in Half Moon Bay of, of slady back gulls of multiple plumages, including uh, first cycle, two first cycle birds that were, were accepted by the committee, which is no easy feat. Most of them, in fact, early on were third year birds, third cycle birds. And um, there have been a lot of immatures. They're not all adults. So um, it's turned out to be a hot spot for slady back gulls. It's been super fun watching them and getting to know them over here. This was one of the most recent ones a uh, couple of years ago now. Real nice looking adult here with a Western gull, little darker backed, um, all the streaking on the head, you know, the duller bill color, and also more white going on here in the, the wings that shows up more when it, when it flies, of course. So, you know, um, these ladyback gulls, I've looked at them in Japan as well too, now trying to figure out how to separate some of these younger birds from, from our hybrids. And that's one of the problems. We have hybrids that can look like these young slady back gulls. But the question is, what actually happened? This is actually a chart um, till 2009. So it isn't even, you know, it's really in the sort of late 2000s that I was interested in what was going on. We suddenly had a real spike in slady back gulls. <laughs> I apologize that I bring back vanilla ice, but here I did it. Something changed, and I think it was ice. It in July, um, sorry, in July of the mid to late 2000s, the ice 
changed radically in Alaska. The, the amount of ice cover, um, this is the line live over here and then this is 2007, the opening up of the Chukchi Sea and, and a lot of the Arctic Ocean during those years was massive. It was an incredible amount of ice shrinkage. And what I think happened is that more gulls of all of these Asian high latitude wandering around in the Arctic Ocean. And then once the uh, Philance, not that far away, as not that much further away from, from Barrow than is Half Moon Bay. And if, if these birds were out there and just sort of went south, this could be part of why all of this was happening. I'm not sure, it's a theory, um, but now there's even less ice up there. So there's something that has been going on and likely Tamarenses and Vegas are all also in there. But, um, you know, I'll just end with saying that the other thing that's influencing a lot of North American gulls is the dumps. Gulls do super well in dumps. This is the number breeding California gulls in San Francisco Bay that actually track the landfill numbers of landfills, which I've, I've gone down now since 2010. So um, we, we probably have more gulls finding more places to eat. And now with the ice flow, ice changes in the Arctic, we may be getting a real shift in what gull species make it out here and what's normal and what isn't. But I'll just end with, well, who cares uh, with all of this? And I think, you know, there's a couple of things here. You can see that I have passion for these gulls and you may not, and you may not, um, um, you know, enjoy them in the same way that I do. But, you know, there's the, the birds that are out there sometimes easy to see. And I would just say to you, enjoy them as much as much as the, the uh, pleasure they give you. You know, it's a, they can be a nightmare. And if they're being a nightmare, leave them or just, just do the adults. There's no reason you have to become a gull fanatic or that it's, it's something that you have to do to earn your stripes as a birder. But um, I also think though that goals are sort of like our world is mirrored in theirs. And um, in the end, they're kind of a lot like us. They're even, they even commute from places where they live to places where they eat. They, um, they're one of the only birds that has uh, problems with trans fat, <laughs> you know, their diet, believe it or not, because they're eating all the cruddy stuff that we leave out in the garbage. And so in a sense, uh, our, our world is their world and they're always around us. And I think as birders, uh, I, I take a great solace in sort of seeing goals around. And then there's all the rare ones too. So why not? It's a kind of a fun group. And I, I'll leave you with that. I'll let you know too that I'm, I do um, these workshops on birds and identification and biology and all sorts of stuff like that, that I will be bringing to this website that I call birdingyourbestlife.com, that uh, all of my workshop educational stuff will be through this sort of membership uh, site that I'm putting, well, it's actually up right now. So if you wanted to check that out, please do. And uh, hopefully there's a question or two out there somewhere. And I'll stop to share here. Thank you. Fun stuff's about to start. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you very much. I think everyone really, really enjoyed it. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and we do have a few uh, questions coming. I, I, I mean, I, I have, maybe I'll start with, with uh, one of mine, mm -hmm. um, which is you said at the beginning, if you see a gull with uh, a band on its leg to report it, where should you report it? Um, the, the bird banding lab, you can just Google bird banding lab report color band and it comes up with this great site where you can report a color band um, and especially, or any goose or anything you find with a numbered uh, pelicans too. Pelicans are a great uh, group to find bands on, but I'm, um, I'm a real band reader, so uh, I love I love doing I love getting the info, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
where it was from kind of thing. If, if you're a real fanatic, you can try to read metal bands. And I, yeah, I've, I've done that we, sometimes. And you, you can photograph them enough angles, you know, we, that you can we, get them. So. Yes, we, 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 we did that with, uh, with uh, the, the short-tailed albatross. Uh, we got photos of the metal band on, on that one, uh, the one was, that was around. All right. Um, so very cool. Thank you. Um, so Mary has a question. Does Half Moon Bay still hold a large number of gulls in February? It can. Um, the, we were talking about this before we started. It, it's real weather dependent. And when it's crummy weather, with, with um, storms, wind, rain, those are the best, best day, uh, times to sort of come out and look for gulls. There's also fewer people on the beach. And um, Half Moon Bay over the years has become super popular, which is great to see people out and about and so forth. But it, sometimes the gulls don't like all the foot traffic. Let's put it that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question from Ted. Uh, what color orbital rings have you observed on Cook's Inlet gulls? Um, that's interesting. Some of these things are... So if I, if I think about the, um, the so actually the Western, the Western, the one I actually looked at more, I think it's simpler to me is, is the, uh, the Olympic gull. So Western has yellow and Glaucus wing has sort of a pinkish purplish kind of thing, you know, and almost always you can see a nice orbital ring on a, a bird that I think is a hybrid. It's the Glaucus wing color. So it's, it's not being passed down like intermediate. It's actually, it seems to be like a dominant effect. Um, if that's, if, and I'm not sure if it's the same thing happens in the cooking like which is herring and, and glaucous wing or something like that. But I do think that herring goals around here are quite variable in their orbital ring color. Sometimes they're yellowish, sometimes they're orangey, but I get really excited when I see a red one because that, that implies Asian species to me and I don't see them that often. <laughs> so I don't know the exactly what I probably could look through all those and try to make a good idea, but I would say that's new for somebody to sort out who's <laughs> it's always good to have something new for for more people to sort out. Yeah. Um, great. Um, uh, Andy asks uh, do you think the lesser blackback gulls in California originate from the West? Um, or are they coming from the East Coast, maybe a breeding population on the East Coast of the US? Um, well, you know, the numbers of, of, of lesser blackbacks in Iceland have been increasing over the years and now they're nesting in Greenland. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're nesting in the Canadian Arctic as well. And that some of our birds in, in North America are coming from either Greenland or, or um, some Canadian Arctic populations we don't know about would be my guess for most of them because banded birds from Iceland tend to be going back to Europe. So hmm. it happens to be, to me, it seems like most of the birds have to be coming from farther west and they're doing very well down east. <laughs> Okay, you know, that, that, that's interesting that they, they're coming from both, you know, yeah, I guess they're, they're they might meet somewhere in the middle of the country. Uh, uh, Calvin asks, uh, do you think that another yeah, reason yeah. for the increase of Sladyback gull records in Half Moon Bay could be related to the increase in birders looking for them? Um, yes, um, but I, I was looking for those things for years until I popped into the first and then suddenly it just was like, what's going on? Because mm -hmm. I thought that was going to be my once lady back all and it would be another five years of waiting for the second and suddenly it was like another one and then next year it was like four and then it was and I don't think I had um, necessarily gotten better at it. I Maybe I was looking more and then there are other people are looking but a lot of the girls here are sort of one day wonders so 
it's either you you found it yourself and saw it or you didn't <laughs> so it's, it's very few sort okay. of hang around in a findable way here which makes it frustrating for the visitor <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay uh lily asks uh do the long primary tip projections on the mugal mean that they're long distant migrants uh, yeah, to some extent, um, but they also are really aerial foragers, so they, they do a lot of picking. Um, they're really light on the wing, and they'll, they're the one gull that can compete, you know, the, the big gulls with Bonaparte's gulls, picking through, you know, when there's a water treatment plant and the, the water's boiling around and they're just trying to grab little bits. So part of it is that they're just, they're aerial foragers, and part of it is their migration. Okay. Um, see, there are hundreds of gulls at Benelli Park in San Dimas right now, including a uh, second cycle lesser blackback. Uh, this is good practice because it's super hard to pick out the rare one and it's amazingly hard. So a comment from Kathy. Um, uh, another comment from John Dunn about uh, short-billed gull. Um, is that uh, John says that short-billed gull was the original name of the species and it was uh, improperly lumped based on two specimens and and we have properly restored uh, the uh, short-billed gull. So well, if um, there's a lot of names that are out there that are old and you could restore them um, and there could be various reasons for doing that, but. In this case, if you're thinking about confusion and simplification of just information, what happens is that the gold people have already been looking at the subgroups within the common mugal um, complex as name groups for years now. So all the books and everybody talks about common goals and Kamchatka goals and mugals. And um, the fact that this separation happened taxonomically, so now we have, you know, Bracharynchus versus the other two. If you leave Mugal, which is what everybody who's alive right now knows him to be, you have not caused any confusion in that everybody still knows what that is because people weren't thinking of the old world ones as Mugals in the old world. They were thinking of them as common goals or Kamchatka goals. So we already had the simplification of this situation. So I think this adds confusion. So if the idea of names is to maintain some level of communication, less confusion, I think in this case, we should have kept Mugal, even though it wasn't the oldest name, even though there was other reasons, um, it truly is a short bill goal. I also think it's an ugly name. And I think people react emotionally to names and we have to give that some kind of value. <laughs> okay, uh, great, thanks. Um, uh, Michelle asks, are all the books behind you bird books? Um, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> There's some bug books. <laughs> some bug books. <laughs> There's butterfly citations and birds. <laughs> um, See, John also points out there are a lot of lesser blackback gulls at the base of the front range in Colorado. Um, and that also that seems to be a you know another you know you know interesting thing. You know, are those coming from you know Europe coming from the west or are they coming from the east? Here's the thing. I think maybe I wasn't clear on that. Is that I think most of the lesser blackbacks are from the east. So that's why I was making a big deal about do tamarinses ever show up here okay. and i think they do but so they 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 show up sometimes from the asian side but most of our lesser blackbacks are probably from the east from the east so okay. we have this weird situation so the idea is then how do you separate tamarinses from a lesser blackback and that's where the uh the fun stuff begins for certain people and nightmares <laughs> begin for others <laughs> Especially if they were ever separated as a species, people would be like, oh my God, you know, how am I going to do this? Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Mary wants to know why was it called Mugal? Where's, where's the name Mew come from? The call, I guess? Well, you know, it's funny. I'm, uh, I'm probably 
um, one of the oddities is mu actually is one of the words for gall, I think in German or Dutch. Huh. But I'm not, and you know, mu gall might go back to a European name for the original European birds rather than the call. But I mean, some of that's, nobody knows that. <laughs> it's sort of all gone. So in a sense now it's sort of what confuses people today and what simplifies is simplifies our life today is I think important. Mm -hmm. um, Van asks, what's your personal pick for the world's most beautiful gull? World's most beautiful gull. Hmm. I've never seen an ivory gull. I bet that's pretty good looking. But I think swallowtail gull is amazing uh. <laughs> from Galapagos. And, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a pretty good looking gull, I would say, in many ways. And it's interesting and oddball. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, I, I have an, another question. When you showed the evolutionary tree of gulls, uh -huh. I was I was expecting Western gull to be much closer to Glaucus wing gull because they you know because of the the hybrid you know, frequent hybrids uh, that we have uh, it, I guess the hybridization is more a function of where their breeding ranges overlap rather than how close the you know species are to each other uh, you know genetically yeah I. I I think so. And you have to think that all these big white-headed gulls are so similar to each other that it's, it's likely that every one of them can actually hybridize with every one of the other ones, given the chance. <laughs> and it's interesting that some don't, right? Like mm -hmm. California gull does not, not tend to hybridize very much. That's kind of interesting mm -hmm. um, in itself. Uh, ring bill gull, you know, well, that's an earlier one, but Yet others, like Glaucus wing gull, seems to be like, you know, <laughs> yeah. one sexy gull. Is it, is it, is it with everybody. With everybody. <laughs> Glaucus, Glaucus wing, herring. And, and part of that may be where it ranges to various things. So. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, John Dunn says, uh, common gull. Uh, post dates mu gull in the old world too is as an English gull. The subspecies Bracarhynchus has the shortest bill, and common is insulting too. If you want to go down that road, <laughs> well, there's I, I can you know there's no way I think I will. Um, convince John Dunn, but I bet if we had a um, conversation with average birders out there, they would <laughs> see it differently. And I think there's a point in time where the committees do have to start thinking about the constituents of what they're creating these names for. And, and sometimes the most logical old school way of doing things that might have worked for a long time might not work in today's world. It just makes people frustrated and we want to have less frustration in birding than more you know that's, that's my my thought you know <laughs> i agree it's the shortest bill goal there's also everything he said is right but i just don't know if it's the right call you know uh, and mary freeman says mew means gull in dutch um so they looked up so okay uh, I don't know if there's any more questions that don't have to do with the name of Mugal and short billed gull. Um, I, knew I, would, I, I knew that would I knew that would be a you know some <laughs> the, the, yeah, all the well, other people like out there you know you, raising their face bring back the Mugal. You, you you just start talking about bird names in any context and you're going to start getting arguments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's one of the things we really emotionally attach to names. I, I've I've um, I've said to people, can you imagine if a if a committee of of dog people renamed the Labrador? What would we do? We would not we would not be happy, right? Because we've always known that to be the Labrador or the or the you know, and and I think it, it's a sense we we shouldn't take these names lightly. They have this content that's cultural and and emotional that 
we are not logical about. <laughs> and uh, going back to another uh, to an older question, um, it's reportban.gov, even though the site is down at the moment, Naresh and Hannah found that at, that's the USGS Great. site that allows reporting bans. Reportban.gov. Right. That's, that's good to know because I think you know a lot of people you know might see a banded gull or, or other bird and have say, okay, yeah. I'm supposed to report it somewhere, I have no idea where. Yeah. And we have lots and lots of comments thanking you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. And including me, thank you very much. It yeah, really you was much. wonderful. <laughs> thank you. And I'm gonna go out and start looking at some gulls. I'm just oh, you'll have fun. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> well, Saturday, um, 20 lucky birders are gonna go out and uh, with Larry Allen and check out see what they can find. So that'll be exciting. Uh, actually, Mark, I think we had a couple oh, more questions that popped we up. We have one more question. How did the shrinking ice affect gull distribution? Oh, so usually there was very little open ocean, even in the, the late fall um, up, up in that region. And then you suddenly had shrinking ice, you had all of this open ocean and probably these birds might be even <laughs> at the ice edge. It's where they, they there's probably most food. So suddenly these birds were way up farther mm. north, perhaps, or in, in areas where they never got to before. And then winter comes, maybe some of them, especially young ones, just went the wrong way rather than going, you know, to the Asian side mm. of the Pacific. When you're, and when you're up there, you're also north of the um, um, magnetic north. So who knows what <laughs> wackiness that creates in some birds. So, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a theory there could be many others um could be just our dumps are really good out here i don't know <laughs> but but it it was interesting that that series of years was when there was a big shift in how the ice melted yeah 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 um yeah we're we're getting lots of comments on the great inspiration and knowledge this talk gave uh, everyone's very enthusiastic about going out and looking at gulls. So, oh, so that, thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me to talk to you about gulls. I'll promise if I come back, I'll talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And, and I won't mention names. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Spanish names. <laughs> Well, again, thank you very, very much. Um, thank you. And I just want to remind everyone, please, uh, we will be sending out notice when our um, when we have an update on the breeding, uh, excuse me, on the uh, winter bird atlas trial starts. So please watch for that. Uh, no, don't forget our next webinar is on November 14th regarding iNaturalist. December. And December. December. Oh, do what did I say? November. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. December 14th. Thank you very much. And anything else I'm missing? Giving Lisa. Tuesday. Go ahead. It's Giving Tuesday. And it's Giving Tuesday. Please, please don't forget Lab. We appreciate it. And once again, I just want to thank Alvaro for uh, presenting for us tonight. And I will see all of you guys. Um, very soon, I think. Right, Lance? So, uh... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, thanks again, and take care, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Happy great. calling. Thank you, Thank you Alex. Yes. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.